Ian, it's a pleasure to be able to interview you again. You, you mentioned in our discussion a while ago as something called peak lopping. It sounds very odd to me. It sounds like something out of gardening. But can you explain what peak lopping is and why it might be part of the answer to reducing aviation pollution? Yes. There are only a couple of times within a flight cycle that the aircraft uses its engines at anywhere near 100% of what it's, the engines are capable of. Usually that's at takeoff, um, just at rotation as it's climbing out of the airport. And the other instance is when they're heavily laden, wet day, full thrust reversers on, landing. Right. Uh, and that they have to be able to be at those high levels to be able to take off if they can't uh, take off. But during cruise, dependent upon the aircraft, could be pulled back to 60%, maybe 70%. But you're not running at uh, full whack. Right. If you've designed your aircraft for, a, for long haul, then you will tune those engines for 70%. And when you're taking off, you will be less efficient because your tuned point is 70%. Right. If you're a short haul aircraft, you've tuned it for the climb out of the airport because that's what you do most of. Right. So if you're just flying from East Midlands to Glasgow, you've just climbed up to 30,000 feet and then you're dropping down into Glasgow. Right. The whole of your flight is spent at climb. Right. So you tune it for climb. But what that means is that that extra 10 or 20 percent that you need to take off um, is less efficient, burns more fuel, and just in general is not healthy. Right. No, I can see that. So if you could run your engines at their peak tuned point all the time, but supplement the power. So we see this, for instance, in the electricity grid. The demand and supply vary through the day. Right. And we have to have enough power stations for the half-time kettle turn on the FA Cup final. The rest of the year, most of those power stations are sitting there doing nothing. Right. And it's the same thing on the aircraft. You've spooled back the engine. It's just not fully working. Go back 50 years. We had an aircraft called the TriStar. And the middle engine was used during takeoff and helped to empty the belly tank first. And for the rest of the flight was turned off. On um, some of the flights, it just idled around to improve the drag of the fuselage of the, uh, of the aircraft. So we know how to do this. We've done it before. What we've got to do is to think about how do we have that third engine or fourth engine, but not have the drag for the rest of the flight. But we know how to do that because we've got ram air turbines that when we lose the engines, these drop out to give some power to the aircraft. Right. For the rest of the time, they're parasitic weight. But if we could use them with a motor generator as opposed to just a generator on there, then we've got some, we can lock the peak. It right. means that our gas turbines are going to be running much closer to their efficiency point for longer. And how much would that save you, just in rough terms? Well, given that there's going to be a small amount of extra weight converting a generator yep. into a motor generator, but you will get that back very quickly. The whole item is already there from regulations for parasitic weight. If you add another one, you've got to think about how that changes the energy density of your aircraft. Right. And if you've got, if you're going to have a 
hybrid aircraft with some electrical assist or electrical power. So that's something that I looked at a few years ago, which was how do I put onto the, the uh, N1 shaft, the fan shaft, an electrical assist so that I can spool up the fan, but without burning any more kerosene beyond its efficiency point. Right. Now, that's going to be easier on your geared turbo fan, particularly if you've got a variable gearbox. Right. And if you look back to the old Citroen cars, that is the same problem that they tried to solve. So if you look at the current turbofan gearbox, they're based on the same technology, the herringbone gears, planetary gearbox, but with an adjustable gear. Right, okay. So we know how to do that. We just need to scale it up. So what do you think of the barriers that, that stop this kind of technology being adopted? It's because we've got very much do as we've done before because we know it works and a reluctance to introduce a new technology that isn't proven. Right. And it's that catch 22. You've got to be able to introduce it to be able to prove it. Yeah. And no one's willing to do that in a commercial flight carrying hundreds of passengers. But what but, we do need is some sort of demonstration area that we can do that. Yeah. So it's inertia, really. It is. It is. Yeah. And, and it's also where the air framer needs to work together with the engine supplier. Yeah. And possibly some of the other system suppliers on the aircraft. And to apply the system engineering thinking that you were talking about earlier. Yes. So one of the things when we looked at the 747, one of the biggest consumptions of electricity uh, on the aircraft was actually in the avionics bay in the power supplies. Right. Almost none of the modules used the power without putting their own regulator on it. And what that spawned was up a whole air conditioning unit. So if everybody just used the power direct off the engines without conditioning it, you would also throw away the air conditioning unit. Right. So when we had a look at it and modified the rack to have um, put together the things that use similar power, we took three and a half tons off the aircraft. Good grief. That must have saved an awful lot of pollution over the years. Um, it will do, do, but when you consider that the unladen weight of a 747 is around about 550 tonnes, it's a small proportion, but it's a yeah. step on the way. It is. And what you've got to do is to say, you've got to look in every nook and every cranny and get your 1% here, your half percent there, and they all add up. And can any of these, I mean, when you think about the kinds of things that they are in, can they be retrofitted or is it just applicable to modern new aircraft? In theory, they can be retrofitted, but the cost of certification is too great. Right. So the easiest way of doing that is on a new aircraft. Right. So you put it into the design that's going to have to be certified anyway. Yes. And it's the if you look back to between 1910 and about 1950, there was huge innovation because we didn't have that regulatory control. Right. But on the other hand, we had an yeah. awful lot of accidents and test pilots that lost their lives. Yeah. And it's that mixture, it's that it's balancing How do we manage the risk yeah. versus the benefit and opportunity? Yeah. And I think we've got to the stage where we've perhaps got to open the risk tap a little bit more 
or find a way of controlling that risk by having uh, some sort of joint led program or allowing a retrofit of an old aircraft that's used for freight only for instance right. and just see whether it works and see how much it can be reduced yes yeah ian thank you very much for that fascinating and once again stretched my brain